from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you. I want you to turn with me tonight to the sixth chapter of Matthew's Gospel and the 24th verse. The sixth chapter and the 24th verse. These words, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism at the same time. You have to make a choice. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism. You know, there's a psychological vacuum in America tonight. Millions have no purpose for living and no motivating challenge. They want a cause to believe in. They want a song to sing and they want a flag to follow. Ernest Hemingway once said, I live in a vacuum that is as lonely as a radio tube when the batteries are dead and there's no current to plug into. Irvin S. Cobb once said, in politics, I'm a Democrat. In religion, I'm an innocent bystander. I remember a story that they used to tell out of the American Civil War. One man said, I'm neutral. So he put on gray trousers and a blue coat, and they shot at him from both sides. <laughs> Christ never allowed people to be bystanders and spectators. The word Christian is from the Latin and it literally means partisan for Christ, a partisan for Christ. You know, they're having all that trouble down in Yugoslavia, and Mr. Tito died some time ago and left a vacuum in that country, and his people that followed him in fighting the Nazis during the war were called partisans. I rem I'm old enough to remember that myself. And they were called partisans, and they committed themselves. They believed in something. And those partisans never play at neutral. They never play at safe. They never sit on the fence. They are never spectators in the struggle of their times. They take sides. They commit themselves. I heard one in Texas, they asked this man, are you a Christian? He said, no, thank God, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> the word Christian in the early days was used in derision. It was a term of reproach. Many people have a wrong idea about what a Christian is. They think that a Christian is a person who prays, who lives by the golden rule, who is sincere, who goes to church, and who keeps the Ten Commandments. All those are good things. They're products, many times, of being a Christian, but that doesn't make you a Christian. That doesn't really make you a true follower of Jesus Christ. A Christian is one that three things has taken place in his life. First, he has made a choice. All the way through the Bible, we're asked to make a choice. Adam and Eve made the wrong choice, and it affected the whole human race because they sinned against God, and that became a disease that went from generation to generation, and you and I have a disease that's going to end in physical death and spiritual death unless we, return, unless we turn to Christ. Every choice we make affects other people. In Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, 30th chapter, Moses called upon the people of Israel, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Choose. Joshua, the 24th chapter, Joshua said to the people, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. I'm asking you tonight to make a choice. You have, many of you have a choice to make. I talked to a man on the telephone this afternoon and I asked him straight out, will you receive Christ as Savior? He said, not now, I'm going to think it over. I have too many questions to ask. And he made a choice, but he said, I'll watch on television and I'm praying that he'll make the right choice. In 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, Elijah said to all the people, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? If the Lord God be God, follow him. If the devil is God, serve him. 
Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go therein, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Think of it. Jesus said it's a narrow gate, it's a narrow road for eternal life, and only a few people are going to find it. Most of the people are going to be on the broad road that leads to destruction and judgment and hell. Which road are you on tonight? You have to make that choice before you leave here. And then secondly, a Christian is a person who has made a change, a change in the way you live. The Holy Spirit comes into your life when you receive Christ and He gives you the power to change your whole way of life. The Scripture says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Your mind, your emotions, your will are all involved in that change, and it affects your whole life when you come to Christ. Many people have made statements about this very thing. Freud said people change by renewing their fixations. Adler, the great psychiatrist, used to say, people change by renewing their goals. Rollo May used to say they change by renewing their efforts towards self-realization. But God says people change by renewing their minds. The Bible has a lot to say about the mind. When you come to Jesus Christ, you don't commit intellectual suicide. You come to Christ with your mind and you change your mind, and that's repentance. You change your mind toward God. You change your mind toward sin. You change your mind toward yourself. And you change your mind toward your neighbor. And you begin to love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible is very clear. To change from a defeated, problem-oriented person depends on first changing the mind because our problems, emotional upsets and feelings and behavior and goals are all rooted in wrong basic beliefs about how to meet our personal needs in Christ. The third thing, a Christian is a person who has accepted a challenge. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. How many of you are looking for a challenge? If any man will come after me, the first thing he must do is deny self your own selfish ambitions, your own self-goals, and you must come to the cross where Christ died for you and shed His blood. Because you see, you and I are sinners. We've all broken God's law and we deserve judgment. We deserve hell. We're going to end up in hell. We're going to end up at the judgment. But Christ came on the cross and by his stripes we are healed. When they took those long leather thongs with steel pellets and beat him across the back, he was doing that for you. When they put those nails in his hands, he was doing it for you. When they put that spear in his side, he was doing it for you. He went to hell for you. He took your judgment and your hell so that you'll never have to spend one minute in hell and you'll never have to face the great judgment of God. That's how much God loves you. God loves you. But he rose again. We don't worship a Christ who's still on a cross. We worship a living Christ. That's what Easter is all about. But God says that if you're to follow him, you're going to have to take up your cross daily. Every morning when you get up, you take up your cross. Now, what is your cross? The cross is the fact that Jesus went out to die on the cross. It was like saying, take up the electric chair and follow me today. Take up the gallows and follow me. You identify yourself with Christ openly and publicly and you're not ashamed of Christ. That's what it means. He would walk down the street and people, and he would call men and they would follow him. Now, some young people here tonight resist the idea of choice of any sort. We've been called the generation of the uncommitted. You don't want, you, they don't want to be called narrow. They don't want to close their minds. 
Christ taught clearly that there are two roads, two masters, and two destinies. We cannot travel both roads, so we avoid the choice as long as we can. There's death in every choice. You die to one road when you go down the other. Life never allows neutrality without exacting a price. Try to be neutral in politics, and one day you'll be confronted with the ballot box. Try to be neutral about the race problem, and it'll, you'll be confronted in your block, in your neighborhood, or on your street, or in your school. And someday, it will come to you. You can't be non-involved in the issues of our day and the social problems of our day. You can't be involved with the thousands of people that walk the streets of King County with no place to sleep and nothing and very little to eat. We have to do something about it. That's the reason we have love and action. We know we can't feed all the hungry people, but we do it as an example as to what churches ought to be doing all the time. We ought to be extending a helping hand to help all of those that are in need. Some people don't want to be involved in their neighbor's problems. There's a time, though, when you must stand up and be counted. Jesus Christ demands that you decide, decide about him. Pilate asked, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Pilate washed his hands. You have to make a decision about Christ. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, some are reluctant to make the choice for Christ because of theology. Uh, you don't want to accept uh, all the things that the Scripture teaches about God and about Christ, even about God Himself. The Bible says, I am the Lord God, I change not. The Bible says, God is a God of love. And then there comes the Bible. What am I going to do about the Bible? I can't accept the Bible. Job says, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. In 2 Timothy, the third chapter, it says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. I don't ever spend five minutes wondering whether this is the Word of God or not. I accepted this by faith years ago, and I've never had a doubt about it since. When you accept it by faith, Nothing can move you. There are things I don't understand in the Bible. There are things that are almost apparent contradictions, but they're not. I just accept it as God's Word by faith. My problem is not the things I don't understand in the Bible, it's the things I do understand. Things that I do understand that I ought to be doing in obedience to Christ. That's what disturbs me. And then there are a lot of young people that say, well, I've heard about conversion, and you want us to be converted? Yes, because Jesus said, except ye be converted and become as little children, you can't see the kingdom of God. What does conversion mean? It just means turn around. I'm going this direction. I turn and I start this direction in my life. That's conversion, just changing over. That's all it means. Don't make a big thing out of it. But it is a big thing because it depends your eternity depends on whether you've been really converted or not. You have to be converted inside, in your heart, not just the outward things. Many people think you're a good person because you go to church, you've been baptized, or maybe you've been confirmed in your church. But you need to come and reconfirm your confirmation vows. You need to come and reconfirm the baptism vows that you took or the baptism vows that your parents took. You need to come and make Christ real in your own life. And then some refuse Christ because of the church. How many times I hear the word, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Well, there's hypocrites in every area of life. I was born and reared on a dairy farm, and we sold milk. And we would distribute the milk to the various customers, and we'd get up early in the morning and uh, send our little dairy trucks out and I would milk the cows, and sometimes I'd go on the truck. And uh, we had several dairies in our area, and so the, when 
price of milk got so low, the farmers began to put water in the milk. Now, they were hypocrites in the milk business, but that did not mean that they were not some real ones. My father would never stoop to such a thing as that. Now, the one requirement for membership in the church is that you are unworthy to be a member. Christ himself founded the church. The church is made up of sinners that have been saved by the grace of God. There's no such thing as a perfect church. If you find a perfect church and you join it, it becomes imperfect. The church is for fellowship. The church is for strengthening our faith. The church has many things that it can contribute to you. But there's another reason that we sometimes say we don't want to come to Christ. We don't want to pay the price. If you want an education, you'll deny anything to get it. If you want wealth, you'll give up all sorts of things to attain it. Now, God gave the very best he had for you. The Scripture says he spared not his own son. The Scripture says the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then there are other young people that are afraid of being misunderstood and ridiculed, do not want to be in such a small minority. The Bible teaches that there may be persecution. There will be. You will be misunderstood. You will be an outsider in many groups. In, and peer pressure is so powerful today in the various school levels, whether it's the university or whether it's the high school. The Bible teaches that you may be an outsider and you may have to seek some new friends because one of the things that happens is when you come to Christ, you enter a whole new social world and you will find that you will have brothers and sisters in every country of the world. It's a great fraternity that we join when we come to Christ. And it may not be just Episcopalians or Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostalist or Presbyterians or Catholic. It may be we just are Christ ones. I've been all over, the, well, not all over the world, but many parts of the world, and I've met people that were absolute strangers to me, but the moment we met, we were brothers. You might not be invited to certain parties. You might not be invited to certain things, and you may have to pay a price for a little while till you make new friends among believers. To follow Christ may be costly business, but the Apostle Paul said, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a part of the cost. It's not easy to follow Christ in 1991 in America. It's hard. It costs something. And then there are many young people that just put it off. You say, I'm going to wait till another time. Proverbs 27 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for you know not what a day will bring forth. The Scripture says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In Lillian Roth's story in her book, I'll Cry Tomorrow, at a certain point she had this to say, I'm an alcoholic and I need help. You need to say tonight, I have sinned against God and I need help. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to be sure if I died now that I would go straight into heaven. Will you say that tonight? And if you're not certain of your relationship to Christ tonight, I'm going to ask you to make sure so that you can leave here and say, I know that Christ lives inside of me. And I'm going to ask you in a moment to get up out of your seat and say that. You must make that commitment. Don't sit on the fence any longer. Just stand out and say, I'm coming. A young man recovering from a motorcycle accident in which he nearly died saw that we were going to be in Sheffield, England for a crusade. And he said, I don't know anything about God, but I ought to hear that man. So he came. He did, and he accepted Christ, and he told his counselor, I almost died without faith. When we win 
one of the places, I forget, some city, there was a 16-year-old girl that gave her life to Christ, and the next night she found her counselor and said, I want to give you a change of address. I'm going back to live with my parents. They came here tonight, and we were reconciled. George Williams, who founded the YMCA, came to Christ in the 19th century in England's West Country, and he wrote this, I cannot describe to you the joy and the peace which flowed into my soul when first I saw that the Lord Jesus had died for my sins and that they were all forgiven. Do you know Christ? Are you certain of it? If there's a doubt in your heart and mind, make sure tonight. I read the life story some years ago of Francisco Pizarro. It brought back to mind today when I was reading about the trouble they're having in Peru. In the 16th century, he conquered Peru. In the midst of great difficulties, when he only had a handful of men left, he drew a line with his sword on the ground. One way was to Peru with riches and danger, and the other was back toward Panama where their ships were and security. He chose to march south to Peru and became the founder of that great nation. Tonight, you stand at the crossroads of your life. You step across that line that has been drawn in the sand by our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, repent of your sin, be converted, come to me. I will change your life. I'll make you a new person. I'll give you new power, a new joy a new peace, a new happiness. I'm going to ask you to come. And by coming, you are saying, I open my heart and give my life to Christ. I want a change in my life. Get up and come. I'm going to ask that no one leave, please. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I want us to turn tonight to the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians. And I, brethren, if I preach works, if I preach legalism, why do I suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Now, we're living at a moment in history in which many people are afraid. We read the headlines, black and screaming. We listen to the television news and we wonder when the Third World War might break out at any time. And we're proud of our servicemen overseas and the heroism that they have shown to the whole world in various parts of the world. But you know, I had the privilege of being a friend of John Steinbeck, the great writer. You remember he wrote Grapes of Wrath, which made him very famous. And one day, John gave me a copy of a letter that he had received from Adlai Stevenson, who was then running for the presidency of the United States. And Adlai Stevenson wrote to him these words, There is a nervous restlessness, a hunger, a thirst, a yearning for something unknown. Perhaps it's morality. Then there is the violence, cruelty, and hypocrisy, systematic of a people which has too much. It seems to me that this is how America is in the, this condition. Having too many things, they spend their hours and money on the couch searching for a soul. If I wanted to destroy a nation, said Mr. Stevenson, I would give it too much, and I would have it on its knees, miserable, greedy, and sick. Mainly, I'm troubled by the cynical immorality of my country. I do not think it can survive on this basis. And unless some catastrophe strikes us, we're lost. But by our very attitude, we're drawing catastrophe to ourselves. What we've beaten in nature, we cannot conquer in ourselves. Now, I made one mistake in that. John Steinbeck wrote this letter to Adlai Stevenson, and uh, he gave me a copy of it. But the thing that touched me was, what we've beaten in nature, We've gone to the moon, not then, but later, but he knew some of the scientific technology breakthroughs that were taking place in those days. But he said, we cannot conquer in ourselves. So the whole world tonight is searching for an answer. A European leader is quoted in the paper saying, if the devil 
should offer a panacea for the troubles of the world, I would gladly follow the devil. We're getting desperate. Emil Bruno once called the cross of Christ the scandal of Christianity, and it is, because the answer to all of our problems are found at the foot of the cross. If we would only repent of our sins and come to the cross, there we would have an answer to our personal problems, our corporate problems, our national problems, our international problems. But you see, we have to remember that 800 years before Christ was crucified, Isaiah the prophet wrote, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. The expression, the offense of the cross, sounds very strange to our modern ears because, you see, we look on the steeples of our churches, whether it's Catholic or Protestant, and we see the cross. It's embossed on our Bibles. It's an ornament around our necks. It's an emblem of art and poets. And this is fine, but it has become sentimental with a certain romantic interest in the cross. But what it really stands for is an offense. It was a place where Jesus was despised and rejected of men. It becomes a stumbling block. It becomes a scandal to men and women. And Isaiah with prophetic vision says, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Paul, living after Christ, found that the cross provoked the scorn and aroused the antagonism of men and women everywhere. Now, why is the cross an offense? Have you ever thought about that? Why is it an offense? First, it's an offense because it condemns the evils of the world. You see, Herod, King Herod, did not like the cross because he was living in adultery, and the cross condemned his immorality. And if you come to Christ, you have to give up that kind of life. You have to change your way of life. So you see, Herod the king did not like the cross. The cross pointed to him and said, Herod, you have to give up that woman that you're living with in sin. And then Pilate, the governor, did not like the cross because he was swayed by the crowd. He was a coward. He was afraid to stand up for what he knew to be right. The cross condemned him. A month ago, a leading metropolitan newspaper poll the supposed social, political, and cultural leaders among its one million readers. And it, here was the question it asked. If you would choose from all of history, you think about this a moment. If you could choose from all of history who you would invite to the best ever dinner that you would ever serve, who would you choose? Do you know that not one single prominent leader included Jesus Christ? Among those they did include was Pontius Pilate, Helen of Troy, Socrates. Why did they not include Jesus Christ, the Lord of history, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who died for sin, who rose from the dead? Why didn't they include him? You know why I believe? The offense of the cross. The answer in the Bible is clear. Because of the offense of the cross, the cross condemns my sinful way of life, and I don't like it. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You see, we are natural people. You that are outside of Christ, if you don't really know Christ, you might be in the church, but you really don't know Christ. You're called natural people whose minds have been blinded by the devil, whose life is controlled by the passions and greed and lust of this world, and the cross points a finger at you and condemns you. Not you personally, but your sins, condemns your sins, because Christ loves you. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will change you. He died for you. But it condemns your sins and your way of life. And the Bible also talks about the carnal mind. It says the carnal mind in Romans 8. The carnal mind, the natural mind, is at enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. In other words, our minds are controlled by something other than the Spirit of God. They're controlled by the thinking of this world. 
We have fleshly minds, and the cross condemns that. And the cross says it's wrong. And the cross said you must turn. You must change your way of thinking. You must repent of your sins. And we don't like to do that. And then Judas, the cross condemned his greed because he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And how many people here tonight are greedy? We think of rich people as greedy, but that's not exactly true. The rich can be greedy, can so can the poor person. A poor person can be greedy too. Greed touches every phase of life. It touches all races and all classes and all economic st statuses in the country and in the world because we can be greedy. We want what the other person has or we want to be like the other person. And we think, oh, if we could only make money, if we could only make more money, we would be happy. But materialism does not offer happiness. And then there was the crowd. The cross condemned the crowd because the crowd was indifferent. It says, sitting down, they watched him. He was dying on the cross, suffering and bleeding, crying, dying. And the cross condemned that indifference. And there are many of you here tonight that are here out of curiosity, but you're just indifferent. You couldn't care less. Your soul, which is going to live forever, doesn't bother you, that you have a responsibility for that soul and that spirit that will be living a thousand years from now. And the decision that you make tonight may determine where it'll be a hundred years from now. But you're indifferent to it. You don't care. Someday you will care, but it'll be too late. You need to come to Christ tonight and make sure that you're ready to meet God. The cross condemns all dishonesty and lust and greed and immorality. And we don't like to be disturbed in our sins. And so that's the reason the cross becomes an offense. When Paul came before Governor Felix, the burning message of the cross condemned Felix, so much so that he trembled. And he said, when I have a more convenient season, I will call for you. But he never called. And this is an indication that you're go some of you will say tonight, there'll be another time I'll have a chance when I get older, when I get things straightened out with my wife, when I'm living better, when I'm in a better position, I'll come to Christ sometime, but not now. I can't pay the price now, but maybe when I get older, I can. There may never be another convenient season. You can only come when the Holy Spirit is speaking and drawing, and the Holy Spirit is speaking and drawing here tonight in this arena in answer to the prayers of thousands of people throughout the country. Yes, it can make you tremble, the preaching of the cross, and your knuckles will turn white on the seat in front of you when the invitation is given, but you won't come because you feel that you have to do something to get ready. There's a new book by Professor Donald Peel. He says, old age is not the religious stage of life. We usually think of old people getting religion, but that's not true. Like the old grandmother who was reading her Bible and the little granddaughter was asked by a friend, said, what's your grandmother doing? And the little granddaughter said, well, she's studying for her finals. <laughs> and many of us think of it that way. When I get older, when things get a little bit different, I get a little more mature, I'll give my life to Christ. But he said that old age is not the religious stage of life. If there's any such development phase, it happens with children of the seven to nine years bracket. He said if there's a religious age in our lives, it's between seven and nine. But I notice in nearly every crusade we hold that the age of the people that come forward to receive Christ is between 18 and 22. That seems to be the age of commitment. That's the age when we're making a commitment about vocation, about marriage, about life's values, and it's the age that we make our commitment about religion. And then it decreases till you get to be about 50, and only a small handful in any crusade beyond 50 ever come to Christ. Why? Because you have hardened your heart. And the Scripture says you can so harden your heart that when the Holy Spirit speaks, you cannot hear any longer. Your conscience is dead. It needs to be resensitized. And when you come to Christ, your conscience can be resensitized. Loyola, 
the founder of the Jesuits, contended, contended that if you don't reach a child by the time he's seven, you may never reach him. You better come to Christ now, no matter what your age is. If Christ is speaking to you tonight, come. And you that are watching by television, pick up your telephone and call the number that's on the screen. There's a counselor waiting to talk to you that will help you to make your commitment to Christ now while there's time. There will never be a more convenient season than right now. Now, the one that succeeded Felix was named Festus, and Paul preached to Festus the gospel. And Festus said, Paul, you're, you're mad. Something's happened to your brain. You've learned too much. And how many of us say almost the same thing to those that come to us and ask us to come to Christ? You're a fanatic. Agrippa said, King Agrippa said, after hearing Paul, almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. Last night, Cliff used that song at the end. Almost, almost in the kingdom, almost persuaded. But the Scripture teaches us that it's the preaching of the cross that we come to Christ. We cannot argue anybody into the kingdom. We cannot talk anybody into the kingdom. I cannot use clever words and great arguments to get you into the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit does it when the cross of Christ is presented. And so the cross has come down through all the centuries, passing its unfaltering judgment upon the vanities, prides, hates, and greeds, and self-indulgent pleasures and lusts of men and women. And it says, you're wrong, you're a sinner, and we don't like it. It becomes a conscience to the world. The Scripture says men love darkness because their deeds are evil. The cross throws light on their evil deeds, and they don't like that. Then there's a second reason, I believe, why the cross is an offense. The cross is an offense because blood was shed there. Now, in Leviticus, the 17th chapter, it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your sins, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for sin. Now, people make fun of the cross, and they make fun of Christ and Christianity and Christians because we talk about blood. But the Bible is filled with the topic of blood from Genesis to Revelation. I took my major in college in anthropology, and I wrote my final thesis on the subject of blood sacrifice the world over. And we never found a tribe, and we never found a people anywhere in the world that did not at some time practice blood sacrifice. Now, where did they get that? They practice it today in many parts of the world. Blood sacrifice is offered to the God of the gods. Why? Because God said from the very beginning when he slew those animals and blood was shed so that he could clothe Adam and Eve after they'd sinned and they were naked before God, he was teaching that the only approach to him was by blood. And when Cain and Abel came along, he accepted Abel's sacrifice. He rejected Cain's. Cain brought a vegetable offering. Abel brought a blood sacrifice, and God accepted Abel's and rejected Cain's, and Cain became very angry and very jealous, and he slew his brother because blood was the way we approach God. Now, what does blood mean? Why did God choose something as ugly and as revolting as blood? Blood means life. When the blood goes, the life goes. Christ offered his life upon the cross by the shedding of his blood. And the Bible teaches that it is the blood of propitiation. That's the mercy seat. It's the meeting place between God and man. It's the covering of our sins. It is at the cross of Christ that we're received as liberated children of God into God's everlasting kingdom. You can only come by the way of the cross where the blood was shed. It's the blood of propitiation or covering. It is also the blood of redemption. Revelation 5, 9, And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Think in that day when we stand before God. And then thirdly, it's the blood of remission or forgiveness. 
the ninth chapter of Hebrews, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. You can't be forgiven of your sins without the shedding of blood. And then it's the blood of reconciliation, Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. It reconciles us to God. You see, the Scripture says God is at enmity with us. That means God is at war with us. We can be reconciled. We can meet around the peace table, and the blood brings us together. It's the same between me and my neighbor or between me and a family member. Maybe there's been trouble between us, but faith in Jesus Christ can bring us together because faith in Christ is reconciling. He's the Prince of Peace. And then it is also the blood of justification. Romans 5, 9, justified by His blood, we're saved from wrath through Him. Think of it, saved from wrath. Now, God is a God of wrath, and His wrath is going to be poured out upon this world and upon you if you're outside of Christ. But the blood can stop the wrath of God. The blood that he shed on that cross brings justification. And justification means just as if you had never sinned. Can you imagine such a thing? Just as though you'd never sinned, as white as a lily in your heart before God, never committing a sin. Suppose I'd been perfect from the day I was born till the day I died. That's exactly what it means. Justification. Just as though I'd never sinned. And then it's the blood of Peace. Colossians 1.20, we have peace through the blood of His cross. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the world would come and bow at the foot of the cross now and we could have peace in our world? <laughs> and it's also by the blood that we come boldly to God, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ. You see, the high priest could only come to God once a year. We can come at any moment of the day as believers boldly into the presence of God because of the blood that was shed on that cross. It's also the blood of cleansing. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, continues to cleanse us. Yes, I commit sin. Some sins I know about, some I don't know about. The things of this world rub off on me, and I need continually daily cleansing, and I'm promised that the blood is available every day to cleanse me from sins of commission or omission. Do you know Christ? Have you accepted Him? And then thirdly, the cross of Christ is an offense because it demands a new lifestyle under the Lordship of Christ. Yes, when you come to Christ, there's got to be a change in the way you live. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That means deny my own selfish ambitions and desires and lust and greed and take up the cross. What does that mean? That means that you're willing to go and die with Christ. He's going to the cross. It means that you're willing to go back to your classroom, you're willing to go back to your neighborhood, back to your business, back to your place of work, and tell your friends that you are following Christ. You take your stand with Christ even though it may be unpopular, even though they may laugh and sneer and make fun of you, you stand up for Christ and you're never ashamed of Him. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. You're never ashamed of Him. You know, many chafe at the restraint of a life like Christ. We refuse to give up what we know His cross condemns. It is evident that many want the Christ of the cross who will not accept the cross of the Christ. We want the blessing of Christianity without sharing the toils and sacrifices that are involved. And crucifixion can be painful. It is neither popular nor pleasant for the old self to die, but that is the road to the Christ life and the Spirit-directed life. No more I, but Christ liveth in me. And then lastly, the cross is sometimes an offense because it is the only way of salvation and it offers no alternative. 
It demands from every man and every woman your first duty is to get right with God. I can preach to you ritualism, works, ordinances, and the offense of the cross will cease. The offense of the cross arises chiefly from the fact that the cross condemns every other way of salvation. There is no other road, no other place that you can find forgiveness of your sin, permanent peace, and find that certain something that you've been looking for for a long time to put your life together. But you don't have total assurance of your relationship with Christ. You cannot say, I'm sure, I'm certain, I know. But you'd like to be able to say that. You want to get rid of those doubts. I'm going to ask you to come tonight and make sure by receiving Christ in a new way or a recommitment of your life to Christ. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen many hundreds of people do this week, if you've already heard. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform. And after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and say yes to Christ. We're going to wait on you right now. Don't you let another minute.